Hello, everyone. Thank you for tuning in to the new Mainstream Podcast, where we explore the impact of multicultural consumers on marketing and media. I'm your host, Mario Carrasco, and co-founder of Think Now. Excited to introduce our guest today, Marissa Nance, founder and CEO of Native Tongue Communications. Welcome, Marissa. Hey, hey, hey. How you doing? I'm doing great. We were just chatting. Um, you have your grandmother here in town, which is incredible. Um, tell us a little more. It's right before the holidays. I think we're going to be publishing this in the new year, but um, yeah. just yeah. just lo- just love to hear about about your grandmother. That was such a great story. Well, it, it, one thing I always say is she's been such a, a beacon for me throughout my entire career. Uh, she is 99 and a half. Don't take that half away from her. She will catch you. <laughs> uh, and you, just my entire life, she's definitely been someone uh, to, to follow and to, to want to, to forge a kind of pathway very similar to the path she has taken in life. And it's very interesting with her being 99 and a half, uh, her reactions to and her engagement with me as an entrepreneur, I, I'm from the Midwest. She's from the Midwest. We're both, you know, I grew up in Cleveland and, um, we're, you know, her mentality is a little more career focused. You get a job, you get biweekly paychecks, you get benefits. And it was a big source of pride for her that I spent 30 years at Omnicom. You know, she, she would brag to her friends, oh, Marissa can retire from then. And so when I left just a few years ago to launch Native Tongue Communications, I think part of her thought, are you crazy? <laughs> you're, you're getting a little long in the tooth, granddaughter, because if I'm 99 and a half, we know how old you are. Um, and so it's been very interesting for her to engage and observe and react to me as an entrepreneur, which is a very different me than 30 years uh, climbing the ranks and being in leadership at Omnicom. Are, are you one of the first in your family to start your own business, to have an entrepreneurial journey, or, or um, is there anybody else that's, that's built a business? It, it's it's interesting. Um, there there are a few there are a few here and there. I am I'm the only girl I- immediately here in a family of of men boys. Um, and then I have some second cousins who are you know there's a few of us scattered around, but it's it's very primarily men. I have a brother. My father had a brother. He had a son. So surrounded by men and a lot of them are athletes. And so my cousin has his own business, but he's a professional golfer. So that's okay. a little different. You know, he's, right. we own golf courses. he's a golfer, um, you know, playing. My dad had this 15 minutes of fame in the NFL. Uh, we have relatives in the NBA. So I, I hesitated only because I thought about it. And while they are a version of an entrepreneur, certainly working for themselves. I don't know if anyone's really done uh, what I'm attempting to do on a daily basis here. So, so you're, you're a trailblazer. And and even if there were entrepreneurs in your family, which there are um, some, a little bit different journey. um, I mean, tell us 30 years at, at Omnicon, what, what were you doing there? I mean, typically, um, I mean, definitely in, in entrepreneurs in our space, I think everyone has their own journey, but one of the most, the usual ones is, you know, coming from an agency and starting their own. Um, but it's, it's usually not a, 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 such a deep career as you've had. Um, tell us a little bit about that journey and was there a moment that inspired you to start Native Tongue Communications? Well, I, I, I was at Omnicom for just about 30 years. Now, it is fair to say that was my first job. I left Howard University. I went to New York City. I was telling someone the other day on a Peter Pan bus. And <laughs> I had a series of interviews. My father, may he rest in peace, told me, I will give you enough money to be in New York City for one month. 
And within a month, you have to get a job. You have to find a place to live. And I have to feel like, you know, we're not going to hear about you on the news. And, and that is what I did. I hopped, you know, graduation was on a Tuesday. And by Thursday, I was on the Peter Pan. I was in New York sleeping on a friend's sofa and, and interviewing. And I ended up uh, uh, with a woman, Judy, at that time, Judy Magnus Long Judy, um, and Judy Jackson now, who was at BBDO. And she was uh, in HR and heard about me and remembered me through the advertising club at Howard Bagley and got my number and called me on the landline. The phone rang. I picked it up and the cord stretched from the kitchen to the dining room where I sat down (laughs) uh, to date myself. (laughs) I tell people, she said, oh, I'm so glad you were home. And I said that to someone the other day who's much younger than me. And they said, I don't understand what you mean. What do you mean? So glad you were home because that's it's a foregone thought, right? Now you're always home with a cell phone. But and we spoke, and she said, "Get dressed and come down." I just had lunch and found out you were looking for a job. Can you get here before five? I did. I got on the one and nine. I went down to uh, Sixth Avenue. I interviewed. I came back the next day. I interviewed again, and by the following week, I was working. So <laughs> it, it it and I just stayed and. What led really to Native Tongue is a piece of why I stayed. I I reinvented myself many times at BBDO and then OMD. I was always part of the media group. I started in media investment. Then I was a generalist and doing media investment and a little strategy. And then I was able to circle back to what I always wanted to do, which was content development and creation. So... Even, you know, in the early 90s, recreating and relaunching a branded entertainment group was a big deal. It, it wasn't as prominent and prevalent as native content is now. And, and I feel so fortunate to have been at the forefront and have learned and to become really one of the best. I, I'm, I'm, I'm happy and excited to say I probably am one of the best in the industry to do this and launch Survivor and launch Top Chef and launch The Biggest Loser and work on FedEx with someone like Bob Zemeckis and Fred Smith and, and uh, Castaway, I'm sorry, work on Castaway for FedEx. So these are all high marks and, and it was a good run. But at a certain point, leadership there said to me, quite frankly, you, you've always been an entrepreneur. You've, you've always found new revenue streams and ways to reinvent yourself should you not have your own agency. And at a time when I, I believe I'm still saying I was the first and I think still only minority certified and female certified media agency to exist, I felt a sense of responsibility and I thought, okay, why not? I love that. And um, I think that's a narrative that isn't told enough is, is the entrep- entrepreneur to entrepreneur route. Um, to me, I, I I had a similar founding story um, where I came from a market research company and built a panel. And actually, the person that hired me is now my my business partner. But I feel like there's so much value you get you get to learn on somebody else's dime, right? Like you get to you get to get all those insights so that when you launch a company, um, I don't know. There's just so many built-in learnings there. But something clicked for me because I, I was curious about how you came up with your name and you mentioned native content. Does that play into native tongue communications? It, it, it does. It does. We, we at native tongue, you know, speak, speak any language. Right. And, and that's really what I feel is a piece of a core insight into multicultural marketing. Um, and I don't mean literally, though we do. We're fluent in Korean and Mandarin and Spanish, <laughs> Vietnamese. But I also mean understanding someone enough to know where their mind is at, what they're really saying, so that they feel seen and heard. And so we want you to know we speak any native tongue. You will always feel seen. You will always feel heard as a consumer and as an audience that we're engaging with. Um, we tell our clients who we love and appreciate all the time, yes, you are our client, but our mutual client is the consumer. 
and being able to step up and in and make them feel less than and invisible and make them feel seen and heard is our number one North Star day in and day out. And so we speak any language and every language. That's that's yeah. So it's 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 native um, from an, a diversity and inclusion perspective, but also, I mean, can you tell us a little bit about this concept of native content um, for those that may not be familiar with that? Yeah, absolutely. So, so there there is something rooted to that. Certainly, native tongue. We do three things really well. So, media. We are a media, as I said, first and only uh, minority certified, female certified media agency. And that's, you know, comms planning, media strategy, programmatic buying. We have a training desk, um, anything that is in and around a media channel um, for a client. Research and insights, and you know that. That's how we met and, and the work we do there specifically around these audiences that we feel have been ignored. And that's that common touch point you and I share when it comes to research analytics and metrics but also mm-hmm. content because it's a three-legged stool. So the media helps us reach and touch the right audience. The metrics and the measurement help us define and understand the insights around that audience. But it's that native content branded entertainment that lets us message to them in a way they want to be heard. You have to have those three legs to your stool. For me, at least, I believe to be wholly integrated and wholly understand and wholly envelop that consumer you want to reach. And so through our branded entertainment and native content, we tend to take media budgets and instead of using them to buy and sell media or plan media, we create content. We produce original content. And uh, it can be short form. It can be social. It can be digitally driven. It can be long form uh, novelas uh, in Spanish language, reality television. You name it, we do it. And um, that's, of course, an area that I've had, as I said, years of experience in. I literally wrote the book in it. Um, so, <laughs> uh, it, it, you know, you can buy my book on Amazon about that topic that I wrote with my, my can jury, fellow jury members. So those are the, the areas and aspects that make up Native Tongue, because, again, they all have to work. So you, you clearly have, you know, one of the best track records in creating content, creating native content, branded content. And I think um, you're probably one of the few people that could just create content based on your experience, your intuition. And yet I know you from us working together, insights very much drive your strategy. So tell us about that. Why are you, you know, what, what, I, I think I think I think unfortunately, and and maybe this is a wrong assumption. I think many media strategists um, don't rely on insights yet. I know that's a core part of native tongue. So tell us a little bit about why it's a core part and how do you use insights to drive that strategy and creation of content? Yeah, you, you heard me say earlier. Our our client is the consumer in the audience, and I spent thirty years working in a business and I would tell people I off time felt like the only chip in the cookie. I would look around a room and I was that voice and I had that seat at the table. And while that doesn't mean I can't be uh, someone who can create successful campaigns for people who don't look and sound like me, I have and I've won awards for it. It did mean at least to me that there was the impetus and and the um, obligation for me to look out for people who look and sound like me, specifically communities of color, uh, African American, Black communities, Hispanic and Latino communities, Asian communities, um, who I religiously and regularly felt like were not being addressed. And when I took a step back to create Native Tongue. If you are not able to integrate on a full funnel, meaning that entire journey from who they are and how they think, the insight, the mindset, to where they are and what they're doing, the channels, the media planning, and what you want to say to them so that you reach the desired impact, right? We're all here to do a job. I want you to do something. Generally, it is 
buy my item or my client's item or service. But you're not going to do that if I don't speak to you in an effective way. If I don't understand who you are and your mindset through those insights, and if I'm not where you want to be spoken to. All those things have to work in tandem and holistically. That's what we do through that three-legged stool I referenced earlier. I love that. Um, I love that. And I think, um, I mean, would you say you, you've launched, you, 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 you have some, um, you know, you have some, some really great clients, blue chip clients. And would you say that insights has been a, a, a core part of that, a differentiator for your company? For sure. We, we so much. So when we began, I, I spent, money, I sold a little blood, uh, and I trademarked a term which is microcultural. I really get bothered by the term multicultural. Mm. And I think in 2022 and beyond, can I say that? I don't want to jinx anything. We got another two weeks. <laughs> uh, this is going to air in 2022. We, we live in an age, and this may be the Gemini in me, that's very balanced left brain, right brain. And so the insights and how they feel and want to be heard is important, but it's also important to drill down, to not have a multicultural, but a microcultural niche audience to understand them at the levels we are capable of based on how we can engage with them, how we can study them, how we can understand them on a quantitative side as well, which I know is an area of passion and purpose for you. So we know without fail and without question if, if we don't take a moment to be empathetic and authentic with these audiences, and we feel like we can, not just because we are from and of these same communities, but because we want to, uh, it also allows us to balance some of the wonderful um, analytics and metrics and proprietary information we have, the IP we have, to weave that in uh, and, and create the audience design that will make the most impact, not just for the consumer, but for our client. I love that. And I, I'm with you on disliking the term multicultural, although guilty of using it, guilty of using it to describe my company, because that's, I mean, that's what clients use. And I'm, I am passionate. I love the microculture um, term that's that's so great i want to drill down into that more and i i have a hypothesis i've wrote about this before about i feel like companies fear getting too specific getting too niche although from what i have observed companies that take the time to understand these microcultures as as you're describing them actually resonate with a wider audience and and i and I have an analogy with like some of my favorite con content on Netflix or a movie, right? I mean, I think the best movies are those, or books even for that matter, that get really specific, right? Really a, a specific, whether it's time, whether it's a character. And even though you may not be of that culture or gender, um, there's just something universally appealing about being very specific. Is that, I don't know, am I, am I capturing kind of this microcultural concept or? or, or? I, I do. I think I, because it's, it's moving past generalizations at a very, for a very broad definition, it's moving past generalizations. So one would think, why would Marissa be, or Marissa and millions of others be interested in watching uh, a, a Netflix series where no one looks like her and it's not even in a language she understands, she's got to have subtitles, yet Squid Games appeals to so many of us. And it, there you appeals, go. it appeals because, and I, I think, it, and, and by the way, there's an ebb and flow to microcultural. So you can't, you can't just peg someone and have that stick for forever. That's what really digs deep into microcultural because we all are ever changing and evolving. And right now, we've all been through not a great couple of years. I mean, I'm sure there are some folks who are like, I've had this <laughs> in my life, and I want to meet those people. Um, I feel very fortunate. I, I launched in January 1st, 2019. 
I was not an entrepreneur before I got through that first year. I distinctly remember looking at my husband and saying, I made it. 2020 is going to be great in January. And then, you know, 2020 was 2020 and 2021 has been 2021. So I feel fortunate to still be here, but I think most in all of us have had some sense of stress, right? It is a global- Just, just a little bit, yeah. It's a global conversation, which happens maybe once in a lifetime, maybe once in every two lifetimes, that the entire planet is on this same cycle. You know, it reminds me of college when I, we were all ladies in the dorm and we all kind of click. We're all <laughs> on the same cycle right now. And so Squid Games today, for the majority of us, represents so much of what we feel like we've been going through. And it just hit at a very brilliant time. And, and it's an example of the three-legged stool, right? Understanding the mindset and the audience of what people have been going through and what they want to see in here. Reaching them at the right place. It's a, it's best for streaming. Nowhere else. And, and, and being a global phenomenon. And then the content was just so good. So that, I think, is is micro is an example of microcultural um you know going from a very broad generalization to very specifically what is something unique and interesting that's going to appeal not just based on ethnicity or age or gender yeah and i and actually that was one of my follow up questions was that um you you're, you're not necessarily reaching diverse consumers although that we know the numbers, we know that's where the growth is coming from. We know that when we look at the younger generation, we're really looking at diverse consumers or non-white. Um, you're talking more about the micro, the cultures that these diverse consumers are are coming from or appeal to. Like, like an example I use often is like gamer culture, right? Like, there's Hispanic gamers, there's Black gamers, and those each have their own microcultures within that broader kind of umbrella term of gamers. That's right. So there's no such thing as a monolith anymore. Um, the, just the world we live in prevents it. It is absolutely, it's no longer possible. A hundred years ago, sure. 50 years ago, maybe even, but it is absolutely no longer possible. It's, it's like saying the only way that I can listen to records now is, is music now is through a record, which I do still. And many people still do, but there are a million different ways. There is no monolith any longer. And being able to um, focus in and say, I know my product or my service should resonate generally with African-American women, but when I dig deeper, that's a very nuanced conversation. And no two, three, four, five, six are alike. How can I really dig deep? Because I would rather reach 50,000 who are going to do what I ask them to do in my call to action than 500,000 and only 10 will do that. That's, that is our goal. That is our promise. We're going to get you that 5,000 that are going to achieve your call to action we're going to show you positive business results because of it. Period. Yeah, there's no like this idea of mass market that no longer exists. And I would even argue, like, did that ever exist? Right? Like, just mass market yeah. med med yes. messaging because of, because of access. I would only say because of access. And cool. and you'd have to go back, as I said, fifty years or more. 50 to 100 years, we started talking about my 99 and a half year old grandmother, um, the access. So the people that had access to your communications were a very specific set of people and they were a little more mass. So you did, there was, there was some sensibility and rationale in mass marketing. Uh, it just is no longer, it's, it's gone the way of, you know, and, and, and look, Nothing is absolute. So that's why I use records. Because as I said, I, I, one of my happiest moments, I'm a mid-century modern uh, fanatic. And I was able to find um, a 1964, 65 console that had the TV, the record player, the radio. You know, it's, it's huge. It's heavier than all of us put together in my living room. And it reminds me of young Marissa, age six, sitting in my living room with my parents, watching 
Scooby-Doo on Saturday morning because that's what I watch when I was younger. So there are still opportunities to respect and acknowledge legacy and heritage. And some of that may be mass marketing, but by certainly it's, it shouldn't be your primary driver in terms of your communication goals. And so um, I guess that's a, that, that's a question I have, like, is, is this, are microcultures um, vertical specific? Like, should every brand be thinking about this or um, is it only for certain brands? Like, I, I think there's a fear out there and, I, and I'm asking this because we do, you know, um, a little bit about our audience. We, we have, it's a 50, 50 split of marketing and insights professionals from fortune 500s who are far along into their multicultural journey. Um, sorry, I know you're, you don't like that word, but that's, <laughs> that's, <laughs> but fall in, into their multicultural marketing journey. Um, and then the other half that they're just, kind of dipping their toes and, and, and are interested. They they know that they have to start thinking about this, but their company's not there yet. And I want to say we are early days in companies really starting to put a focus on multicultural consumers. So we have a good amount of people just wanting to get best practices. So I guess tell I mean walk us through a little bit about, you know, if you're a company interested in reaching microculture, I think a lot of the pushback is, oh, you know, it's too specific. I mean, tell us a little bit of ROI. How do you get started into that journey? I mean yeah, just just given 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 the audience of our podcast. Well, I I'll say two or three quick things. The first thing I'll say broadly is uh, I, I, multicultural, I understand. It's just, you, what did I say? Know your audience. And I know right. our audience still speaks in multicultural. So I, I, I do not hate. Um, and, and I understand the use of the word. I just am encouraging everyone to say microcultural because then I can charge you because I own it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I trademarked it. So you it. Um, two, uh, let me grandstand a little and say, yes, I think every single client and company and service and product should be thinking in this way and they should be calling us to do it um, because we do an exceptional job at it. And, and the third piece of that is just broadly, no matter who you are and who you're working with and why, uh, if you don't, this goes back to empathy. So empathy and authenticity are always going to be at the core and beginning of our journey. Any of those three tenets, so be it media, be it insights, research metrics, or be it content. In, uh, you know, empathy and authenticity are always the beginning, you know, and on your, on your mark, get set, go. That's where we start. That's where we begin. And when you begin on your journey, uh, when following that path, you're going to hit success because that's just going to lead you naturally to a microcultural conversation. You understand? But if you refuse, and I'm sad to say this happens more often than not, to be empathetic and or at least listen to what might be authentic, then that's when you go broad. And and so I, I have worked with in the past uh, partners who – it may not look and sound like the audience they know they reluctantly need to reach. And as such, they make a lot of mistakes because they make a lot of assumptions and stereotypes and tropes that are just embarrassing, frankly. And and I have no problem standing up. I We started, I said, I have a seat at the table. I will tell you, I will tell you clearly and cleanly, that is wrong. Here is why. If we proceed along this path versus that one, we can absolutely confirm and promise you engagement and resonance at the levels and KPI you desire and see the results in terms of, of, of business, the business results you want to see. You know, the profitability. We, we deal in profitability. Everybody speaks green, and we understand that, and we want to see our clients, services, and products excel. And so, I I love that because you're 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 bringing it back to the KPI. You're not. It's it's so much better for a brand, right, to have five thousand people 
be actual customers versus 500,000 people who saw your ad and may or may, you know, did or did not convert, right? So I I think um, the fact that, you know, it's not a nice thing to do, although it is, we should all be empathetic. Um, it, It does make business sense to focus in on microcultures. That's right. That's right. And, and I think sometimes that's where I struggle a little bit and I get a little, um, depleted. Those are the days when I might step away and have a glass of red wine at the end of the day, because commonsensically, even if you don't want to be empathetic and authentic to these audiences, because it's the right thing to do, you should do it because it's going to be the right business decision and you will make money. <laughs> so the fact yeah. that people still are, you know, heel to the ground, you know, and they're just refusing, foot in sand and refusing to do it, it's, it's, it does sadden me a little bit. So, for you know, uh, believe it or not, we're almost at our time, but I, I, I want, if it's <laughs> possible, if it's possible to share like, a case study. It doesn't, if, if you can share the client, that would be great. If not, that's fine. We can leave it vague, but I'd love for you to walk me, walk me through like a recent project that you had that started with an insight. And what was that insight and how did that drive the strategy or media or content? I won't get into clients or brand names, I will tell you recently, very quickly, top of line, um, for a cosmetics brand, that brand said, we believe we should be thinking about multicultural audiences. We haven't done that much specifically in and around them. Any ideas? And we looked at the timing. We thought about the audience. This is... uh, female focused or people who identify as female, fo- you know, or, or want, yeah, I don't care, want to use the, the product. It could be anyone. Our focus was, was slightly more female or identify as female. And um, it was very much a, and I touched on this a little earlier, a sign of the times. And we realized when we thought about women of color, they had been disproportionately as much as all of us. And I said, this was a global uh, 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 conversation. We're all on that same cycle here in the States, people of color, communities of color and women of color had shouldered disproportionately so much more than others and all the metrics and all the numbers and qualitative and quantitative research reaffirmed that. And so we looked and we said, this is a cosmetics brand. And the timeline is such we're coming up on world smile day. And if anyone needs a smile, It is this community, these women of color who've been through so much and really haven't had reason. And no one has stepped up and in to own World Smile Day. Let's do it. And so once we understood that mindset and found this unique place to poke, we then went out and found extraordinary partners um, uh, in the space. And uh, it was an integrated partner that allowed us to, even today, because we know for women of color, this is still an important channel, print, digital and social to create a layered and integrated campaign around World Smile Day and our cosmetics because, you know, look good, feel good, show your smile, that beautiful lipstick, all of that good stuff. And then the last piece of it is um, we want to see a result. And so we brought in a retailer. We have a lot of experience in retail marketing. And I'm happy to say when we combined these insights and this right messaging with the right channels and this retailer, it was one of their top five days in sales at this retailer ever. Um, And that's a big deal. That's what we Um, promised. Amazing. Amazing. That's, I mean, kudos to you and your team. Love to hear that. Yeah, it was just, it was an extra, the numbers that we saw were definitely disproportionately higher in the stores that we were participating in than the stores we weren't. Uh, It it was just an uptick in sales and that's what we wanted to see. And so the client's happy, uh, uh, our retail partner's happy, 
our our agency partners are happy. Everyone is happy because we did what we said we would, which is we started with what is a unique and interesting microcultural insight and attribute in and around this audience, and then let's mine it. Let's mine it in all the right places and channels, and let's say all the right things. It's that three legged stool. It's literally that simple. I love it, and I think that's I think that's a great story to end on. And thank you so much for joining, Marissa. Thank you for being a partner. Um, been enjoying kind of learning more about your company and yourself as we work together. Um, for listeners on the podcast, what's the best way to reach you, follow your company if you want to drop your social media handles? Uh, you know, here, I should know those off the top of my head, but I'm going to go OG old school. And I'm going to say you can always email me at marissa at native tongue communications with an S dot com. Marissa, M-A-R-I-S-S-A at native tongue communications dot com. And we encourage follow all of our native tongue communications at native tongue communications uh, social handles. We've got uh, a little thing we do what we have done since we really started in and have gone through this pandemic is every day we post an inspiring quote from someone interesting. And and we're going to steal one from you, Mario, and post it in the coming weeks. And oh, Okay, great. Ho- hopefully, uh, it brings people a sense of satisfaction, peace, joy, you know, even a laugh. And so do follow us. And I hope all of those positive emotions come from that. And I hope everyone listening has a wonderful and magnificent holiday. We all come back to 2022 ready to just kick it through the goal line, kick it through the goalpost. Thank you so much for sharing your story, Marissa. And thank you everybody for listening. Bye. Thanks to everyone listening in. To get more multicultural insights, check us out at thinknow.com and follow us on social media. You can also subscribe to this podcast on your favorite platform. Final thank you to our producer, Lucas Martinez, who created our intro music and makes our podcast sound great. To email him, reach out to martinez.lucas.a at gmail.com.